Welcome to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. Each week, we hear real-time stories from athletes and CEOs on how to maximize performance through an endurance mindset. Let's get started. Welcome to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. Today's guest is an entrepreneur, consultant, pain specialist, photographer, and a best-selling author. She is an expert in how the nervous system works with the body's healing system to show you how to get out of pain. She's completed two 100-mile ultra marathon and four-time Boston Marathon finisher. The founder and CEO of Paber Institute. Please welcome Amy Navati. Welcome, Amy. Thank you for having me on, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here and really nice to meet you. And I know we were connected, um, my mutual friend. So it's just always nice to meet people who are on this kind of journey and path to help people in the world. Awesome. I'm, I'm really looking forward to digging into to a lot of what you do. But before I get into that, I want to talk about the endurance mindset. Amy, how has the endurance mindset impacted your life unexpectedly? I would say for me, I, I kind of took it the sports way. Um, I got into running marathons unexpectedly. I really thought I would never run a marathon. I never had any desire to do it. And um, I've always kind of pushed hard my whole entire life where I grew up and went for straight A's from kindergarten to grad school. I just always kind of tested the limits. And so I got into running to help me cope with some things that were going on in my life. And I learned what endurance really meant at that point. From a physical point of view, I guess I'd already experienced it mentally and emotionally and intellectually, but I didn't really think of it that way until I started doing marathons and then ultra marathons. And that provided a lot of comfort, a lot of time to process emotions, a lot of time to develop dreams, goals, and really see what my body was capable of. Prior to that, I didn't feel like I could accomplish those things. Certainly. So why running? Well, at the time, I was, I, I'll put it out there, I was going through a divorce and I didn't have a lot of furniture. All I had was a treadmill and a TV that someone had given me. And so I started, this was a long, long time ago. I started watching Biggest Loser while walking on the treadmill because I had nowhere else to sit. So I just said, okay, I'll start walking. And once I started doing that, I was motivated by watching that show. I started jogging. I jog a little bit, walk a little bit, and then I began running and I started doing it outside and someone mentioned I should try a half marathon. And so I realized as I was training and as I started running outside longer distances, I really liked the nature and the outdoors. It was very comforting. And now, based on what I do now, I realize that the rhythmical motion our nervous system really likes, so it helps us calm down. And when we can calm down, we can process things. And so that's kind of why I turned to running also because it was solitary. I was also an avid tennis player, but it required me to find someone, schedule it. Running, I could just do when I wanted to. It is magical when you're out there by yourself with your feet in nature, connecting. And yeah. it's interesting you make that point about the rhythmic aspect of it. I haven't thought about it that way. But I find that when I'm running or cycling, like my creativity just bubbles up. Do you mm -hmm. experience something similar? Absolutely. So our nervous system needs to be calm in, for, in order for our creativity to increase. And if you can use running and get into that flow state that some people can get into, where your breathing calms down and your heart rate calms down as you're moving, that allows your creative juices to start to flow and increase. And so it's nice time to think of things and you know work on a new project or anything like that in your head you know i was exploring your website earlier and there's a video of you talking about how you used uh breathing technique to help you drop about 15 minutes in your marathon time to qualify for boston can you walk us through that like what what were you doing how as us as an audience who are avid runners mm -hmm. cyclists swimmers you name it um really get in tune with our breathing to help us with our performance? Sure. So at the time, I was a physical therapist. I got my doctorate in that. And at the time, I started exploring the asymmetries in our body and how we're not, asymm or we're not symmetrical on the inside of our body. And that affects us in our breathing mechanics. So I started experimenting on if I changed my rib cage in certain ways, 
my breathing mechanics would change and I could calm myself down. So it's not breath work that people know out there. This is something completely different than traditional breath work. And I started working on this process that I developed into the PABR method and how I changed my rib cage position to change my breathing mechanics so that I could feel my body release tension when I was running. So as I started running, I was already running marathons, but as I started running, as I was developing this, if something developed tension-wise or pain-wise during the run, I could use this breathing technique plus repositioning my body and I could get myself out of the pain immediately or, or within a couple minutes. And so I started using that and experimenting on myself first and putting this into a process. And when I did it and I did it effectively, I could run marathons without pain and my speed just increased big time because I started just everything calming down. And when your body can calm down as you're moving, you can have faster turnover of your legs. And that faster turnover, if you can keep yourself calm as you're doing it, you can increase speed without changing anything else. I didn't change weightlifting. I didn't change my runs at all. I didn't change speed work. I, nothing. All I changed was my breathing mechanics and controlling my nervous system. And so when I did that, that's how I dropped off time off my marathons and just blew through the qualifying times for Boston. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Talk to us a little bit more about your business and, you know, mm -hmm. what you do, who you look after. You, know, you give us a little bit of a sense of how you develop this methodology, but give us a little bit of the history. Sure. So I, as I mentioned a little bit ago, I started off as a doctor in physical therapy and I worked in a sports orthopedic clinic, saw people for various issues, weekend warriors, chronic pain, you name it. And I was very bothered personally, by the chronic pain population because traditional physical therapy methods helped but didn't fix them. And considering I spent so many years studying the body, going through grad school, that there wasn't a good solution for people in chronic pain, I, I started looking elsewhere. I started looking at other things. I st studied through the Postural Restoration Institute, I started looking at breathing mechanics, and then I started looking at nervous system and the autonomic nervous system specifically, the fight or flight nervous system versus the parasympathetic. And I, once I started studying that and I started experimenting on myself and other people, I realized that there was a huge link to from pain to your nervous system. And if we can start to learn to control that nervous system, we can get people out of chronic pain. And once I started studying that and experimenting it and developing this technique, I shifted away from physical therapy into what I call the PABR method. And PABR stands for Pain Awareness Breathing Relief. It's just an acronym that I came up with because we're dealing with someone who's in pain, someone trying to get to relief. And what are we really doing with them? We're changing the breathing mechanics and we're increasing the awareness of their nervous system and their body position. So that's it's just a, something I came up with. Nothing specific, nothing fabulous, but how do I conceptualize what we're doing with someone? And it's hard for someone just to grasp because it's not, it's not hey, you're going to go buy an apple. You know what an apple is? Here's an apple. This is something very, it's, there's a fluidity to it. So let's say, Greg, you had right shoulder pain and it's affecting you running. I know we're going to have to calm your nervous system down, get your rib cage to change change position so that you feel your shoulder differently than you do right now. Mm -hmm. I need to get certain muscles to calm down that you don't even know are contracting and holding you in your shoulder in an incorrect position. And we need to get other muscles to activate to support you after we get the ones calmed down and releasing you to get your shoulder to really free up. And that's kind of, and I, so I started developing this. And so my business now is working with anyone who has any type of pain, stress, anxiety, insomnia, anyone who wants to avoid an orthopedic surgery. Um, sometimes people just come see me for anxiety, um, PTSD. So all of these, the common denominator is that fight or flight nervous system that gets ramped up too much and causes our body to behave in a way that we're not aware of. And my job then and role is to teach you how to 
become aware of how your nervous system is working, then how do you calm down the nervous system so it allows your muscles to release? Because right now, the muscles are being told to contract without your awareness, and we need to release that abnormal contraction so that your bones and joints let go, and so emotions that are stored in your body let go. And so I do this with people on Zoom, and I have clients all over the world now that I do it with. It's interesting. I'm, I'm super aware of everything in my body right now. I feel like my knees talking to me, my hips talking to me. Um, Amy, I'd love to dig into the mindset aspects of the work that you're doing. Like when you see a patient and they have this pain release, there must also be a, a mindset shift with them as well. Like, like they're free from pain, so therefore they can do X. Can we talk about that a little bit? How how does mindset fit into this? It does. So as we start working, most of the people I work with think that they've been injured and that injury defines them and that limits them. And they think that to fix that pain, they need to have someone do something to them. Their solution is external. That's how people come in with that mindset. When they, when we start going through stuff and they start feeling their body change without me touching them and only with them doing stuff to themselves, their mind changes and they realize that their healing comes from a change within that they can control. And what's great is then when they start to do more activity, so let's say they start cycling again and they go out for a 10 mile ride and they're like, wow, I don't have any back pain. So not only did they have a mindset shift that now they have hope for a different future, but I always stop and make sure they connect the dots and say, look it, you didn't stretch. You didn't have someone push on you. You didn't get adjusted. You didn't have someone poke you with a needle. All you did was change an aspect of your nervous system and how you position yourself. You felt your muscles change, and now you can do that. So you truly control how you feel in your activities. And so what you say about mindset is really spot on because I need that to instill in their head because we're always going to develop things in our body. So five years from now, they get in trouble, they do something, they you know tighten up, they have a whole bunch of stress. I need them to remember, oh, I'm not injured and I don't need someone to fix me. I can go back and do it because that gives them so much more power because any stressor they have, they can now work their body out of. And that stressor doesn't turn into a huge problem that it would have before because now they know they have power over their body. And that's really where the mindset work that we have to do and get someone to change. That's so powerful. Um, I've got tons and tons of questions, but I wanted to shift this again a little bit and talk around mm-hmm. habits because I suspect mm-hmm. that once you've had you've worked with a patient and they feel some relief and they're getting back to at some point they got to continue that journey on their own on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Um, mm-hmm. How do you encourage habit making with the patients you're working with? So every time we work together, I give them. Um, three to five different things to do. And I ask them to do it for just a couple minutes, a few times a day. And I say, this is not like you have to go and spend an hour at the gym twice a day. This is, I need five minutes when you wake up, maybe five minutes before or after work, five minutes or so before bed. And so what they're doing is we're trying to change a little bit of their habits so they sense something different about their body. So our nervous system doesn't like to be bombarded with a whole bunch of new stuff it changes in a more subtle way when you do a little bit stop you go off and about your day then you do a little bit more and you stop and you do a little bit more it's gonna you're gonna ch- start to change things easier and you're gonna have a more gradual shift into new habits when you can do a little bit of a change and sense and feel the change that's the key if i can get you to sense your right rib cage dropping down, Greg, and you feel your shoulder drop down and free up, your brain just realized something that felt really good. So your nervous system's going to start going, oh, I want to do that again. 
So the next time you become aware of your shoulder, you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to drop that down and release it. Oh, good. And you start feeling that good feeling, your habit is going to start to change. And pretty soon you won't hold that shoulder up high. And so we do this with the whole entire body, but you get them to change the habit. So it's not overwhelming, but it's just subtle little changes that they can implement. Going a little deeper on that, no pun intended, I guess. um, How does someone feel their right rib cage? Is it literally they got their hand on the right rib cage and they're, they're, doing some sort of motion or is it truly a mental recognition of particular spots in your body? So it's an actual physical thing that you need to recognize mentally. So actually both of what you said. So sometimes I'll have someone start with their hands on their own rib cage and I'll say, as we blow out, I want you to feel this about your rib cage. And they can sometimes they can sense what's happening under their hand with their ribs. Sometimes people don't feel it for a while, but if they can sense it and feel it, then we encourage that and say, okay, what does your mind sense in your rib cage when that's happening? I'll say, okay, if we take the hands away, can you still sense that happening? So sometimes we have to develop what is that physical sensation and get that connection back to the brain. None of this is just all mind work. There's an actual physical component to everything we're doing, and there's a physical rationale to everything we're doing. That makes sense. Um, you've got to have a couple favorite stories of patients you've worked with and have gone from A to Z. Can you share one of those with us? Sure. So I have a lady, she's in her 70s, and she, she was referred to me by a psychiatrist for anxiety. And this was a few years ago, and she was unable to leave her house other than to work with me. And she had b- bladder issues a pit in her stomach. She was non-functional, couldn't really work or anything in life, nothing social. And so we started working together and she couldn't lay on her side. Everything was very specific to her body. She could only do a few motions or sit in a certain way. Um, Long story short, she climbed Mount Humphreys in um, Humphrey Peak in um, Arizona. A few, you know, Short while later, a year or so later, um, just finished her first triathlon. Um, she started a whole new career. And she's in her 70s. She's, she started a whole new career. She's now a realtor selling luxury real estate. Um, she's She was, spent a summer over in Europe two summers ago. She's traveled all over. And she went from not leaving her house, not doing anything, having a little bit of social, inter- not even social, but just work interaction just online to traveling the world and that's finishing her triathlon. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Um, shifting to your business, do you have a, a staff that you've taught this technique to that allows you to sort of get your impact broader to the community? Not yet. No, I have plans to teach people how to do this. Right now, I do have an online video course that allows people to start learning and they can do that on their own. Um, I just recently had a baby. So prior to him uh, in 2022, um, I was doing group sessions. So having multiple people, but most of my work right now is just one-on-one and then the video online courses. Is, I'm spending a little bit of time with my little one. As you should. It's a magical yeah. moment. And I, they they always will tell you that time goes so fast. My oldest is a freshman in high school and it feels like yesterday that we were in the delivery room. Yeah. Amy, I have, to, I have to ask about the penguins. I see penguins on your website. I see penguins behind you. There's mm-hmm. got to be a story there. It is. So this process, um, when I was first um, starting the business, I was hired by a world-famous photographer to keep him out of a knee replacement surgery. And he had just fallen and torn up his rotator cuff and biceps tendon. And he had come to see me before his fall. And we got rid of all of his knee pain, hip pain, uh, body pain. He had a fall and tore up his shoulder and was told he had to have a uh, shoulder um, rotator cuff repair surgery. And he had several international photography trips planned, and he didn't want to have surgery because it would limit his ability to teach and to lead these trips. So he hired me to travel around with him and his partner for six months to teach him how to calm his nervous system down, to regain his motion, keep him out of pain and out of surgery. And 
um, that six months ended with us down in Antarctica. And I'm a photographer as well. And so these are some of the photos that I took down in um, the South Pole. And penguins are a symbol of rebirth, strength against adversity. And so I adopted it as my symbol for the company because so many people think that's the end for them. And if you can just go against the adversity and really work hard and meet the right people, you can change your life and be all odds. That's amazing. I love it. I love that story. Uh, curious about photography. When did you get into that? I got into it. I started learning at the end of 2015. I started volunteering for a nonprofit in Arizona that led photography trips. And so as a volunteer, I helped just assist to make the prices of the trips a little bit and the workshops a little bit more affordable for people. And so I just started volunteering and I, I helped them edit one of their photography books. So I learned photography uh, at the beginning of 2016. And then I'm um, just helping with some of their trips. I started picking it up and practicing and I fell in love with it. And um, it led to a lot of some nice awards and some great opportunities. The Penguin stuff was actually in a gallery showing in 2020. So that was kind of neat as well. That's awesome. Um, shifting back to your business, you mentioned you do, you've got online courses mm -hmm. and you do a lot of virtual work. Was that the case before the pandemic? Or is this a, a pandemic benefit? I would say it's a pandemic benefit. I was doing some online, um, but prior to 2020, I did have an uh, in-person office where I worked with people in person and did some online. But then uh, March 2020 gave me that little shove that I needed to switch everything online. And basically, I've been online since then. And honestly, people learn better and it forces them to learn versus me in person, putting my hands on them. I stopped doing all in person and now it's only online because the benefits are so much better. You know, it's interesting. I love my chiropractor and I try to see her once a month and I've been working with her for probably 20 years, as does my wife. Yeah. But now that we've gone through the pandemic and I've gotten so used to being behind a camera, it's hard for me to be like, hey, I'm going to go jump in my car, drive to her office, have a 15 minute appointment and come back. And so I tend to stop going, which then leads to pain and other things. But um, to your point, we've got into that mentality of, you know, driving and, you know, getting ready in the morning for work. Um, so anyway, you got me on a different tangent. Amy, I, I'd love to know a little bit more about you. you. You talked about your childhood and how you thrived in these sports and your straight A's. And, but give us that gap between sort of your childhood and discovering physical therapy. Uh, well, let's just leave it at that. So growing up, I was always interested in life, fascinated. I challenged myself in every which way. Um, in high school, I um, did all AP courses. I pushed myself in college. I studied abroad in France, backpacked Europe, uh, volunteered in Australia. And whatever I, opportunity I saw, I said yes. If I could somehow figure out the finances, get scholarships, I just said yes. Because I've always had the mentality that if someone else could do it, so could I. Why not? That's always just been my mantra. Why not? Um, and I did research in ecology, and I was going to go down that route. Um, I presented at an ecological conference, and I decided I really liked people. I really liked physics. I liked biology. Those were my two favorite subjects. And so it naturally led to physical therapy and going to grad school um, for physical therapy. It's just a lot of times we think and we're taught, go to school, go to college, get a job, settle down, you're done, and life ends. And from point of birth to grad school, I was always doing a million things. I was always in a variety of things. I always had to have something athletic, creative, intellectual. I wanted to always cover myself in all realms. And once I got out of grad school and got my job, my house, I became stagnant for 10 years. And I realized this is not fun. This is really, this can't, there has to be more to it. And 
I wasn't around any entrepreneurs at that time. And I didn't know what having a business was like. I'd always said I never have a business. But I didn't understand because I had never been exposed to that. And so after that, after taking that leap to travel around the world, I said, I cannot go back to being in a job working for someone else. And I said, it's time to start a business. And I had no clue what I was doing. I had no money. I was like, I I just asked a few people and I just jumped in and I said, okay, I can always go back to the job. But why not take a leap right now? I have nothing tying me down. Why not take a leap and try? And I'm glad I did. I'm really glad I did because it led to a lot of opportunities and it led me to having a baby and being able to work from home and have a nanny and just be around my child all the time. So there's a lot that there's a lot more to it, but that's kind of the general gist of me. Thank you for sharing. Uh, so what is it like running a business? We've got a lot of entrepreneurs that follow this show. I'm an entrepreneur as well. For those that haven't started a business or are thinking about it, give us some words of wisdom, some cautionary tale about sure. running a business. So I would say, first and foremost, start getting around entrepreneurs. Just start hanging around them because you start to learn tidbits and you learn ways to speed up the process for your business or to even start a business. I wouldn't recommend just jumping in cold turkey like I did because I had no clue what I was doing. And it leads to a lot of tears and frustration. So I would say first start hanging around other people and you can start asking questions. They will help you say, okay, you want to get a business license. You want to set up this and this and this and and kind of guide you through it. And they will tell you what is working right now to help you get clients. I was somewhat lucky after a few months of starting my business, I took a leap of faith and decided to go to an investment conference completely out of my realm. I knew nothing about investing, but I knew it was people that were driven, driven by money, but not driven by health and who were likely not taking care of their health. But I also wanted to learn about investments, too. It wasn't just self-serving in the sense that I wanted to try to get money and, you know, people, you know, people as clients, but I was truly interested, too. And so I didn't tell anyone what I was doing. I didn't tell anyone, like, my business or anything. I just went and I just listened. And I just kept showing up. This one group offered different events and I just kept showing up. And eventually one of the, um, the host introduced me to Robert Kiyosaki and said, you need to help him. And Robert Kiyosaki wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He co-wrote it with um, Susan. And once he started working with me, and I can say this because he's, he's the one that told people, he started calling me his body healer. So other people started saying, what do you do? What do you do exactly? And so that's how I got my foot in that world. But again, I didn't, I didn't try to solicit. I just showed up and I just became friends with people. And once they found out what I did, they would ask more and they say, oh, can I, can I try it? And I started presenting at events. And so just kind of when you're thinking about starting a business, show up, start getting around people that will help you much more than I, than I, for me, I never went to business school or anything like that. And probably not the best idea in the world, but I just started showing up and meeting people. It's, it's the best way of getting word of mouth. And Improving your reputation too. What you see is what you get and people know that. And so I tell them, yes, I can help you. No, I can't. That's a great point. Um, And and it comes back to relationship building, right? Mm -hmm. You're you're active in that community. You're building positive relationships and Mm -hmm. staying with it and being committed. and, And eventually a door opens and you go through that door and the next door opens and you go through that door. And all of a sudden you look back and it's, how did I get here again? I wasn't intentional. I mean, it wasn't the fact that you're building relationships, but where you ultimately ended up uh, tends to be, can be a random random walk. Um, You're also, Amy, a best-selling published author. Talk to us about your book or is there multiple books? Yeah, as part of a couple different books. So there were, there were co-written books and they're like a compilation book. So a couple of them, they're, they're mostly about tell your story. Um, what struggles have you overcome? So like success habits of super achievers, 
It was a Amazon bestseller in numerous categories. And so um, Kyle Wilson, he's the one who put this together. He's kind of the the brain of, of it. He reached out to a lot of people in the personal development world, healthcare world, um, medical world, and um, investment world. And he found people that were high achieving and said, okay, what habits do you have? What really makes you perform at a high level? And so I wrote in there other people, Darren Hardy, some other people who are in the personal development world and different worlds um, wrote and we put this book together. And so it hit a lot of categories. Um, I was also part of um, another person who puts together books, David Corbin. He's in the branding and an entrepreneur world. Um, he put together a book, WTF to LOL, um, and it made Wall Street Journal bestseller number two. Um, again, s- something like that. It's a compilation book. So um, I added my piece to those books. Wonderful. And we'll include links to those on our on our show notes for sure. Um, so what are some habits of high achievers? So for me, for, for my stuff, um, I, I get up early, but not too early. I try not to use an alarm clock. An alarm clock can be very jarring to your nervous system. So I make sure I go to bed at least one sleep cycle before midnight so that at the sleep cycle before midnight is more deep sleep that helps your nervous system calm down. So I tell people, try to get in your bed by 10 o'clock so you can be asleep by 1030 so you get a full sleep cycle before midnight so you're shifting your nervous system to calm down. So then you can wake up naturally without an alarm clock jarring your brain and sh- shocking your nervous system. And one of the first things I do is I curl up in a ball and work on making sure my nervous system is calm, trying to get my rib cage dropped down, work a little bit on the specific breathings that I teach. Um, then I typically get up and I do something outdoors. It's always good to have the sunlight hitting your eyes to help reset your circadian rhythm. So. Prior to baby, I ran. Right now, we go for a walk. Um, but I carry him, and he's 24 pounds at eight months. So um, he is a workout as we climb up and down hills. So um, so those are some habits. The other things that I find that are really successful is always responding to people within 24 to 40 hours. I try to make it 24 hours. Occasionally, I have to go a little bit longer than that if I miss something especially now with the baby, but um, I eat really healthy. What you put in you is going to determine your output and your ability to think and be emotionally under control. It affects you hormonally as well. So I eat organic, plant-based, and I make sure I'm well hydrated. So these sound very health-oriented, but they actually help your mind and your ability to be emotionally calm in stressful situations so you're not reactive, helps you with your focus, those types of things. Those are, those are great habits. And to your point, it ultimately influences your nervous system and how your body's reacting mm-hmm. so that you can perform at your best when those times are needed. Amy, how can an audience member get in touch with you? Sure. The easiest way is to, to send me an email, amy at paberinstitute.com, A-M-Y at P-A-B-R institute.com. And they, you can reach me through the website too, which is powerinstitute.com. So either way, just go there and go to the contact page or just send me an email. Awesome. And again, we'll include those in the show notes for sure. Any parting thoughts for our audience? Any words of wisdom? Sure. Give them some encouragement to try the, your, your method. Yeah. So when you're going about your day, this is going to sound very intuitive, especially for all you endurance athletes out there. Let your belly hang out. Let your gut hang out. Let your belly button just relax out because what it does is it drops your rib cage down. And you can try this right now. If you suck your gut up and in, your rib cage lifts up. As soon as you do that, you change your breathing mechanics to a fight or flight pattern and you tighten your body up. So if you can periodically throughout your day, let your rib cage drop down by your belly releasing and sit back in your chair, you'll start to feel a lot different. A lot different. That's awesome. I'm trying it right now and it feels so awkward. <laughs> Amy, it it's been it's been wonderful having you on the show. Thank you for your contribution. I, I'm inspired by the work you're doing and we'll be on your website signing up for courses momentarily. Um, again, thanks you for sharing your methodologies, your insights, 
this audience will certainly benefit from a little less pain in their life, a little less stress. Um, so to those audience members, if you like this show, please subscribe. Please share it with your friends and family in your community so we can get our message out to a greater audience. Again, Amy, it's been awesome having you on the show. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Craig. Thank you for tuning in to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. To hear more inspiring stories and strategies around the endurance mindset, be sure to subscribe below or visit us at chiefenduranceofficer.com. Until next time, keep pushing those limits.